Star Hit Parade, starring Frank Sinatra. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? And now, smile a while with Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Belle. Manhattan merry-go-round that brings you the bright side of life, that whirls you in music to all the big night spots of New York town, to hear the top songs of the week sung so clearly you can understand every word and sing them yourself. This is the Golden Age of Radio. I'm Dick Bertell, and tonight we'll take you on another audio excursion back to radio's formative years. You'll hear the programs that made the era golden, and meet people who made those broadcasts a reality. The Golden Age of Radio is brought to you by WTIC and the Cromwell Savings Division of Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank. Hometown friends serving your best banking interests in every way. Now here is your host, Dick Bertel. Good evening, and with me once again is radio collector historian Ed Corcoran. Ed, we're going to uh, turn the tables tonight. I'm going to introduce you to our guest. Hey, that would be different, Dick. Yes, it would. <laughs> now, do you remember Terry and the Pirates? Oh, yes, very well. Do you remember a, a femme fatale by the name of uh, Burma, by any chance? Oh, yeah, did I, do I ever remember mm-hmm. that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like the Dragon Lady, only better. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly that's right. <laughs> Burma, would you, uh, would you greet our audience, please? Well, I'm very pleased to be here. I really am. It's lovely. Oh, you want me? To, well, no, no, no. Oh, if you wanted more Burma, I want more have Burma. To get it more Burma because it was the woman known as Burma. Oh. <laughs> our Whatever guest, that means. our guest is Francis Cheney. Francis Cheney, who played the part of Burma on Terry and the Pirates and countless other characters on countless mm, radio programs throughout that great golden era. Francis Cheney is currently appearing as Bessie Berger in Awake and Sing by Clifford Odets at the Hartford Stage Company. And Francis, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight here on the Golden Age of Radio. Thank you. How did you get started? Because I know that you and countless other actors and actresses more or less look down on uh, on radio. Well, I, don't, I, I wish we'd known immediately. What we got to know very shortly after was that Uh, Radio, for us in those days, provided not only a means of earning a living, the way nowadays kids starting up in the theater in New York earn their living doing commercials. They've got to somehow find a way to keep body and soul together while they're looking for that great break in the theater. Sure. Sure. So in those days, there was radio, but some of us were just terribly highfalutin. We weren't going to have any part of it. So I finally got started in radio in the perfect way, because I did. I think it was the Mad Queen Catherine in, in a Shakespeare opus that uh, Earl McGill directed. So that was all right. You see, I could look at my teachers at the neighborhood playhouse with uh, uh, casting my eyes. Yes, I could, li- I could live with myself since I was doing Shakespeare. But very soon after, I'm happy to say... I really got started. I think my very first program was a gangbusters for Phillips H. Lord. And then poor old, dear old Phil, he decided that I should be the ingenue in a revival of Seth Parker. Do you remember Seth Parker? Yeah, it was a religious type program. Yeah. <laughs> and I think he decided he wanted me for that because I couldn't sing. He would break up so, sitting in the control room, having me sing. Little children, little children, who love the Redeemer. I can still see his face. I think that's what he liked about it. But I couldn't see That's a delightful story. We have heard many Phillips H. Lord stories. That's the first time I've ever heard about him breaking up. But um, the story of, of, of how you got started... The way they 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 uh, did the publicity on you is just amazing. Oh well, <laughs> that that taught me not to believe your own publicity. <laughs> Tell the story, Francis. Please. Well, it was a it was a story by Ernest Hemingway called Twenty Grand with an all male cast. Yeah. And I was fresh out of dramatic school, and what did I know? Anything anybody asked me to do, I do it. So they said, "Honey, now you come up to the." publicity department and we'll tell you what to wear and then you come for this show and you bring your sunsuit and we're going to take pictures out of it. They're going to do a big spread on me. See, Miss Cheney, the, the upcoming budding starlet at CBS. So they had me come with this sunsuit and I got into my sunsuit and got all jazzed up, fixed up and sat on this high chair in front of this microphone. And there was, they put the director on his 
knees down on the floor, directing me with a baton. And, I, you know, these men standing around, and I didn't know what was going on. I thought, well, that's what they want me to do. I'll do it, sure. And then the picture came out, and I saw it in a magazine. And there was me sitting on the chair with the director down there on the floor, directing with his baton. And underneath the caption said, and Miss Cheney, this is Ernest Hemingway's 20 grand with Miss Frances Cheney, who wore a sunsuit to give her freedom of movement in her role. And I didn't have one word to say, not word one. That's so beautiful. There you are. Just goes to show, as you pointed out, you just can't believe your own publicity. Well, uh, to break into that, that, that circle of uh, of actors must have been a very difficult thing and you were you were well, you were still a teenager weren't well, you well yes but i'll tell you everybody was very very loving and kind they really were there was a there was a kind of spirit it was like a great big giant stock company and people helped each other i'll never forget running into agnes moorhead on the third floor of nbc and she was an established performer and i said aggie they want me to be a soap bubble <laughs> she said honey you go in there and be the best soap bubble you can be <laughs> So there was that kind of thing, but also you you did have to be pretty good. You really did. You really had to be pretty good, and you also had to be very versatile. Now, one of the things that helped me enormously was I spoke several languages fluently and could do dialects, so that I could do I could be used on a march of time or on a program that needed doubling or tripling or quadrupling if necessary. And I'll never forget being so delighted with myself once. I had to play two or three parts on this kind of news uh, documentary kind of program, which we were always doing, it seems to me. There was always a big, spectacular documentary about some event or other. So I had to play two or three parts, and I did two parts, and they said, Francis, can you do a Greek accent? And I wasn't sure I could do a Greek accent or not, but I said, oh, well, sure, I can do a Greek you accent. You always said You yes. always said yes, of course. And you got... Kenny Delmar, whoever knew how to do a Greek accent on the side, seeing he'd coach you, and then by the time you, you had your two or three lines, where well, you could do it pretty well. Well, the Greek accent part came in second, I think, in between these other two that I was very good at. One was German and one was something else, you see. So I did the first one, that was fine, and then I did my Greek one. And I was so happy with myself being able to get those words out and do it right. I never did come back for the third. Oh. I just wasn't there. I was just sitting there just accepting all the praises from the rest of the cast. I think somebody else had to fill in for me. We, a lot of funny things happen. Those things, those things did happen all the time. And we might point out for the benefit of our uh, younger audience why there were so many uh, dramatic documentaries because there weren't the recordings that we have today. The actualities just didn't exist of, uh, of the people in the news. So you acted... Yes. Yeah, the, the, parts well, yeah, the actors, the uh, they sounded better than the original people who spoke the lines because uh, they, they were just politicians, <laughs> you know. We'd learn, we'd learn how to talk. <laughs> that was our <laughs> well, people it's, would play Winston Churchill oh, and... Uh, yes. Oh my Franklin goodness. Roosevelt, yeah. of course. Yeah, the Claudia, I guess, was imitated quite often on the sh on the air. Stalin, all the world figures at that time. Were yeah, all it was an accepted technique. And of course, well, I don't today. Know when March of Time ended. How long did that run? You would know, of course. Well, probably into the forties. Yeah, well into the forties. Mm. Then it went on TV for a while. Mm. And uh, in fact, I have a, a film of that, uh, one of the TV shows they did. And then uh, then it, it kind of faded from sight. Well, it, let's let's talk about a show in which you had the uh, lead. One of several shows in which you had the lead, but. Uh, <laughs> This was a uh, one of the top nighttime programs, Topper. Topper, yes. Well, How did the that come about? The, well, I had to come and read for it and auditioned along with other people, and they decided that they wanted me to do it. And of course, the thing that delighted me was to do it with Roland Young because he was marvelous. He was not only lovely in the part, and he was just as good on radio as he was in the movie of it. I don't know. If, I'm probably people listening don't even know what what that was. Why don't we explain just what the concept was? Uh, might be a good idea. Yes. Well, uh, the topper. Well, I believe there were the Mr. and Mrs. Kirby were uh, killed in an accident, and then uh, they came back as ghosts, uh, yes. somewhat like the Invisible Man on television today. And then uh, they had trick photography so that they, you know, you could sense their presence. They could see uh, things moving, but they were they were they were there, but you didn't see them. And the Roland Young is the only one who knew who they were, and they kept. Uh, 
bugging him uh, all the time, kind of like Jeannie. Uh, yeah, but the, they were they the were TV. they were a very charming and sophisticated couple. Uh, yeah. The girl was sort of like a Carol Lombard. Yeah, Car- actually, she was more, more like a Constance Bennett. Yeah, and and, 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 and and the man was. Uh, Suave and debonair, and they, they, sort of the quality of the thin man yeah. is that kind. Yeah, they're right. And and uh, this top, uh, Roland Young's character was a feat and funny and darling and, and lovable. But he really he was such a charmer, and I I I was just crazy about him. He, um, well, I was just trying to think if I could think of anything special. But well, he was just he had. The same kind of quirks, the same sort of mannerisms in life that he had on the screen, but he was a truly gentle and gentlemanly fellow, and mm-hmm. he, was, he was just an enchantment to work with. I loved doing Topper. How long was that program on the air? I don't think it was on terribly long. It seems to me it was only on for a season or two because it was sort of towards the end of the Halcyon radio days, because this was after the war, you know, that Topper was on, and... Uh, Television began, you know, just a year or two after, didn't it? I mean, yeah, it was right about so it wasn't that too time. Long after that, so that the Topper didn't... moved into TV. Yeah, so that it didn't it didn't last terribly long as a radio show. Maybe a couple of seasons, I would say. Ed, do you have a Topper in your collection? Yes, I think I did manage to grab one here, and uh, we'll hear and see how it sounded. Uh, I just want to make one comment that uh, in the movies it was all visual. I just wondered uh, in radio, did you have a difficult time emulating a ghost and that sort of thing? Because that's what you were. You were a ghost. Yeah, uh, you know, that's uh, oddly enough, Topper should be clearer in my memory than it is, but it really isn't, even though it was one of the later things that I did. I think the war had something to do with it. Because as a, to me, Topper... Always, I always remember Topper because of something that happened. Uh, I, it was just before uh, VJ Day. Topper started that summer, mm-hmm. and uh, VJ Day came around, and I remember VJ Day very clearly because a very strange thing happened to me. I got the measles. Now. <laughs> You know, to get the measles is just a dumb thing to get. How I got the measles, I don't know, but I had to miss a show. They had to cancel a show because of me. That would stay in your and mind. It, no. Yes, it stayed in my mind very clearly. That and VJ Day. That There was something, well, somehow, the VJ Day was more important. Well, we'll me. refresh your memory right now. <laughs> Topper. Hey, Topper. Oh, Topper, darling. We're back. Here we go again. The Adventures of Topper, starring Roland Young. The Adventures of Topper is a new comedy series based on Thorn Smith's hilarious bestseller and is brought to you by the makers of those bubbly light crisper cornflakes, Post Toasties. Now, let's meet Topper. How do you do? My name is Cosmo Topper. Looking at me, you wouldn't think I was suffering from one of the oldest diseases known to man, blonde trouble. And when I say she's out of this world, I mean it. She's a ghost. This blonde ghost I was referring to is Marion Kirby, who, with her equally frivolous husband, George, have really been complicating my life. With them around, my simplest problems always wind up as disasters. I'm getting to feel better already. Confession is good for the soul. I should tell Melvina everything long ago. No more George and Marion for me. Ah, uh, I spoke too soon. George! Marion! Are you in this room? You needn't think I can't tell just because you're invisible. Oh, speak up, I tell you. Yes, they really aren't here. My nerves must be getting the better of me. Don't mess up my hair. Mary, I knew you were here. Now, no more of your silly pranks. Speak up. I'm no longer a man to be trifled with. <laughs> All right, talk to you. Darling, you're so cute when you're cross. Don't you know it's not ladylike to sneak in on people just because you're a spirit? Now, don't be an old cross patch, Topsy. But you need some fun. Darling George and I have a great day planned for you. He ought to be along any minute. 
Mary, I want you to get this off my chest at once. I'm a new man. I've taken a new lease on life. That's an idea. Lately, you've been looking as if your old one had expired. Mary, I mean, I'm not waiting for George to pick me up. I'm not interested in your plans for me today or ever. In fact, I'm leaving you from now to walk, take a walk by myself. Why, Topper, do you think I'll let you go on that note? Aren't you going to stop me? Marion, take your arms away from my neck. Marion, get off my lap this instant. <laughs> Topsy's getting angry. Topsy's getting angry. Mary, I for, forbid you to sit here. Even if you are invisible, what if my wife should come in? Oh, I am in. Oh, Cosmo, you're talking to yourself again. Oh, my poor dear, so burdened down with care. It's not the only thing I'm burdened down with. The best thing for me now would be if I could stretch my legs and take a short walk outside. A walk? Oh, no, Cosmo, you mustn't. Why not? Uh, well, uh, 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 someone is coming. Uh, I mean, uh, well, you look so comfortable in that chair. Oh, Cosmo, remember when we were first married, you always asked me to sit on your knee. <laughs> Well, why don't you ask me to sit there now? Right now, Melvina? Yes, of course. Ask me right now. Well, I can't. There isn't any room. What? I mean, I never had much of a lap in the first place. My legs are so short. Oh, God, well, what are you saying? <laughs> oh, now, dear, I insist. After all, large or small, a lap's a lap. <laughs> Well, if you insist, let me make a suggestion. Well, what is it? Why don't you let me sit on your lap? <laughs> That's Topper, as uh, portrayed by our guest tonight, Francis Cheney. We'll get back to uh, Francis' story right after this message. One and one usually makes two, but sometimes two things join together and become one. This isn't you, man. It's the all-new combination of Cromwell Savings and Farmers and Mechanics Savings Banks. In an age of expanding and changing bank service, these two old friends and neighbors have joined to maintain the greatest customer convenience for thousands of lucky customers. An account at either bank is an account at both, which means these hometown friends can now serve your best interest in every banking way. Full personal banking service, including checking accounts, available January 1st. But you can begin right now with savings and loans at both, because an account at one means an account at both. So one plus one equals a bigger one. The Cromwell Savings Bank Division of Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank has two convenient locations, at the corner of Main and West Streets and the new Cromwell Plaza office near Kmart. Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank have offices in Middletown at Main and College and also on Washington Street. Other locations include Montville and Colchester. Member FDIC. Francis Cheney is our guest tonight here on the Golden Age of Radio, and uh, we're talking about, oh, some delightful programs. We've heard Topper, and uh, you were in Gangbusters. You did oh, a number of yes, Gangbuster shows, indeed Francis. Indeed I did. Indeed I did. What type of uh, part did you play? Well, were you typecast? Was, oh, well, no, that was another thing about radio. You didn't have to be typecast. You were voice cast. Oh. You know, it depended on what you could do, whether you could sound very young and, and, and high-pitched, or whether you could sound low and sexy, or whether you could sound like somebody's mother, or whether you were, you know, or that's what it depended on, so that the typecasting depended upon that, really. And you were typed, in a way, because people got to know the things that you were good at, and those were the things that you were used for. But it didn't have anything to do with what you looked like. So that very often, people who were fat and dumpy could be absolutely adorable and enchanting, or... Mm -hmm. Uh, vice versa. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's about what happened. I found, for me, uh, that that I did mostly, I did mostly nighttime radio, and I think that somehow, uh, either the versatility or the variety or the different kind of voice range seemed to suit that better than just a soap uh, part on a, on a morning soap. And I love doing the nighttime shows because from they seemed to me more exciting and more fun to do, and because they were a complete segment in themselves. There was a class distinction. There, there was. It had to be. Yes, there was, and it, it was different. You, it was sort of, you thought of yourself as more of an actress. 
Yeah. <laughs> you thought of, of the many more millions of people who were listening at night, well, too. Well, I, I hadn't really thought about that. I think but they it pay was, you a little better, too. They <laughs> did pay you a little better, but you wasn't steady like the soaps in the morning. Same thing is true today in television, you know. You get paid a little better when you do that nighttime yeah, show, but you don't have that steady paycheck coming in mm -hmm. like when you're doing a, a soap opera. But it is more fun, and, you know, one makes one's choice about what one wants. Well, you know, we, we uh, talked earlier about the character Burma, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to uh, think in my mind, is a program like Terry and the Pirates uh, a soap opera as far as no. the actress is concerned? Or? Well, it was, it was a program geared for children. Yeah, it was late afternoon. It was for the kids, and they'd have those wonderful jingle. What was it? Quaker Puff Wheat Sparkies. <laughs> right. And the opening, <laughs> the Terry and the Pirates, and right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, but the thing that I liked is there I was on this kiddie show, really. Well, it wasn't it was a kid's show, you know, appealing to young, to teenagers and, and, uh, but playing this heavy, sexy character. And it was marvelous because I could do anything. It was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you know, saying, oh, well, is that, you know, it was sort of a cross <laughs> between Mae West and uh, God knows what. I haven't a clue. But it was fun. It really was. We had a wonderful time doing that. Really now, fun. Did that originate in New York? Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, and uh, I'm trying to think now. That program was on on the. Uh, ABC oh, Network, I believe, at 6.15 at night for yeah, a while. Was that live? Yeah. Well, it was live and not live, because they used to do a repeat. Do a repeat, yes. yes. And I, I know that because the Chicago announcer would turn in a little earlier, because <laughs> he liked listening to me. I'd get fan mail. <laughs> From the Chicago announcer. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you now? <laughs> How did the uh, how did the part come about? It, was it just a routine audition, or getting it? You mean? Yes, yeah. it, it seems to me it was always that in radio. I, there was never any other way. You never. I, I never knew any other way. You were called for an audition, and you came, and you auditioned, and you got it. Or you were called directly for the show. Now, when it was a series, you always were called for the for an audition. But when it was just a show, like being called for a particular part on. Uh, district attorney or gangbusters or mole mystery theater. They knew you when you became established. They knew you worked well enough. You didn't have to audition at all because they wanted you, and that's 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 the way you got the job. They wanted you. You really were cast from memory, then, weren't you? Well, memory, and they heard you. Yeah. Goodness, they had enough tapes and records, and I never kept any of them, but people, the, 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 the directors had them, and they could listen to them, and, and everyone in the business knew, they knew, they, you could recognize voices. My children have learned to recognize people doing commercials, so, yeah. you know, it's, it was exactly the same thing. The thing that, that we have... Uh, by the uh, way, excuse me, yes, you, you did get the same kind of fan mail, too, that you get on television today. Oh, people wrote you letters and sent you presents. And Did you ever, ever get any love letters of, other than that Chicago <laughs> announcer? Well, I ain't going to tell. <laughs> <laughs> we, we found, Ed, I think you'll uh, back me up on this, that uh, it, it was a young group of, of actors yeah. and actresses, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. They were all well, in their uh, 20s, 30s yes. at the most. Yes, that's true. That's true. They, they, they were. We were, I guess. There was quite there was a range naturally of ten to twenty years, but once you got going uh, and learn how to do it, because there was something to learn. There's something different to learn about each of the acting mediums, and the thing that happened in radio is that you learned to act mostly by hearing it. You heard, and something about the way it sounded to you caused you to respond a certain way, mm -hmm. and you couldn't afford to take the time that you can when someone sees you. I mean, dead air was the worst thing that could happen. You better learn how to fill up that dead air, which is one of the things that you learn, because I remember my very first time on Gangbusters, I lost the job because I didn't know that you had to come in quick, pick up a cue fast, or fill in underneath or that if you were crying, you were allowed to cry underneath the other person's talking. I thought, oh, you better keep yeah, your mouth yeah, shut. You don't stop talk. Stop. Yeah. You see, well, you learn. You learn how to do it so, because the whole problem was exactly the same as it is in any one of the acting mediums, to make it believable to the person listening. Sure. They yeah. had to believe, and they wouldn't believe unless you learn how to believe Believe it, really believe it, as you did it. When you worked in a series, Francis, over a period of time with the same group of people, 
Did um, did you ever uh, begin to clown around or uh, break up or? Uh... Oh sure, but if you're a professional, it's your job, you know, to keep going and know how to do it. And oh sure, crazy, nutsy things would happen. You know, scripts would fall out of people's hands. You'd make faces at each other while you were talking to each other. You'd tweak each other. You you know, of course. But mostly, you were really terribly earnest and serious about your work. Uh, I have found that most of the people that I worked with in those days were extremely serious and dedicated actors. They really were. They loved being actors, which is a funny thing about actors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was true. We thought that, like these uh, afternoon uh, kids shows, they were done tongue in cheek, you know. But they really weren't. They they were just as serious about those oh, as if sure. they were doing Shakespeare. Sure, really. absolutely, of course. Well, because we're off you the had camp. an audience we out can't there help that was it. believing in you, That's too. That's right. That's and uh, right. You, you did have a responsibility to them. Yes, indeed. Well, I... I and, to, and to your job. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to... Uh, that's true. I've got to hear Terry and the Pirates. You've got me psyched up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dick, let's roll the tape on this one now. Now, Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice bring you... Terry and the Pirates. The new and exciting adventure of Terry Lee and the Pirate Gold Detector Ring. Connor, I owe it to the memory of my father to save his name, to find his murderer. And for the first time in my long search for the ring, I've got something to go on, thanks to you. Let me get back to Shanghai. Let me see Turnbull, and I promise... No, son, you shall not get away. But why, Con? Why? This is the fateful hour in the destiny of the cult of Nan Kai Feng. Unless the gold detector ring is returned before the new moon rises, and we are thus able to ascertain whether this is the true idol, the ancient curse of Ping Yang shall fall upon us all, and all our people will die. I respect what you've said, Khan. I realize the importance of your problem, but oh, why do you insist I have the ring? Isn't it obvious Turnbull has it? Didn't he promise to return it to you and then renege on that promise? Indeed, he promised to return it. And he would have done so if you and your friends had not intervened. He has told us distinctly, my son, that you have the ring. And you trust his word on it more than you do mine? Yes, because we know how important it is to you to have the ring. Of what use could it possibly be to Mr. Turnbull? I don't know. But I'd sure like to find out. You are deluding yourself when you question Mr. Turnbull's honor and integrity, my son. He is a great man, known and respected throughout the world for his kindness, his generosity, his philanthropy. We cannot doubt him, but we can doubt you. Mr. Lee, help us. Help us to save our province. We know you have the ring. Give it to us. You shall go free. Withhold it from us longer, and you shall pay the full penalty. Terry's eleventh hour draws closer in the form of an unnamed but perilous threat which the Khan now holds over his head. Meanwhile, in a secluded tea room hidden away in one of the side streets of Shanghai... We'll have to make this meeting pretty short, friends. My date with Turnbull is in less than an hour. Why in the name of Aunt Martha did we have to pick this revolting ghost nest, huh? Because it's out of the way. We won't be overheard. And there's no chance of Turnbull seeing us all together. So eat your soup, Boston, and stop yammering, huh? Yes, Bob. Nice little stories in the papers, aren't they? Yeah. I was reading them just before you came. Poor Terry and Connie. Plastered all over the front pages. <laughs> Murder suspect stage daring jailbreak. Police spread dragnet. Magistrate says no clue yet to whereabouts of Terry Lee and Connie. But their capture expected momentarily. Oh, Anybody with any sense could tell looking at that picture of Terry that he never would commit a murder. Look at him. So nice and, and so honest and so sort of cute. I can't stand it thinking of the trouble he's probably in now. What are we going to do? I only wish we could remember the name of that top. Oh, it's, it's a funny name, Pat. It's like Nanky Poo or something. Oh, fine. Somewhere in the province of Gilbert and Sullivan, no doubt. That should give us a hot lead. Okay, wise guy. If you're so smart, what have you two turned up since this morning that might be considered a hot lead? Well, not very much, I'm afraid. Pat, I'm kind of ashamed. Now, of wait a minute. Though. For practically ten years now, Pat, ever since Terry was a kid, you've been running his life here in China, watching him like an old mother hen, ordering him around and telling him when he should brush his teeth and go to bed. 
And yet, what happens? The first time Terry really gets into a jam, you just sit there and don't do anything. Mother Burner, may I have the salt, please? Oh. And as for you, Patrick, you'd better sit in the corner for the next half hour. You're... You're right, Burma. I, I know I haven't been much of a help so far, but I'm doing all I can. You haven't exactly been sitting still, Burma. In fact, we did just a little sleuthing about an hour ago. Pat, will you stop jiggling that little box around? It makes me fidgety. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure, sure. Sorry. Say, let me see that box. I thought you might be interested. Pat, it's a box of cough drops with an American label on yes. it. Where did you find this? In the house where Chung Fu was murdered. <laughs> They ought to move that place to an amusement park. It'd make a first-class spook house. Do those little lozenges mean anything, Burma? Mean anything? Do you know who uses cough drops just like these? I've seen him take them. I was hoping those might be something our friend Turnbull left behind. I know these are Turnbulls. Friends, I could be mistaken, but this innocent little box here might very well be the weapon we need against Turnbull. If these won't make him talk, I don't know what we can do. What are you going to do with them, Burma? Just leave that to me. Uh Uh-oh, look at the time. I've got to be getting back to the garden. Take it kind of easy with that guy, Burma, will you? We like having you around. Oh, sure. Don't worry about me. Well, I'd better be shoving off. (laughs) Meanwhile, see if you can't figure out what the name of that province is. And you, Hotshot, check your friends, won't you? We've got to figure a way somehow to help Turnbull get back to the stage. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Terry and the Pirates. Oh, boy. That's great. We'll get back to our guest, Francis Cheney. my children here. (laughs) We'll get back to Francis Cheney right after this message. Cromwell Savings Bank, a division of Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank, is now taking applications for new checking accounts in any one of the six banking offices. You heard correctly. Cromwell Savings Bank is now a division of Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank. And together, these two hometown neighbors will be serving your best banking interest in every way. And beginning January 1st, 1976, you'll receive full banking service for checking accounts, too. Stop into any one of the six branch offices today and apply for a new checking account that will start you off to better banking in 76. Cromwell Savings Bank and Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank have offices located in Middletown, Cromwell, and branches in Montville and Colchester. And now an account at either bank is an account at both. Cromwell Savings Bank, a division of Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank. Member FDIC. Our guest tonight on the Golden Age of Radio is Francis Cheney, who is appearing at the Hartford Stage Company as Bessie Berger in Awake and Sing by Clifford Odets. And we're talking, of course, about the, uh, the days before uh, television. We're talking about uh, those golden days of radio. And... We were we were discussing earlier, Francis, the fact that you did most of your work in in New York. But mm-hmm. uh, did you ever get out to to Hollywood? Because a well, lot of radio originated out there. Well, I did, but not until uh, I went out to Hollywood to be married, really. And and uh, when when I went out there, I started doing some radio, and it was funny because I I got to work with people like uh, oh. It doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter about the names. But finally, I got a call for a show, and I thought, well, somebody wants me for this part. I wonder what it could be. And I came to see about They didn't want me for the part at all. They wanted me to be the voice of Fatima. Oh. <laughs> Which was, you know, from Fatima's cigarette. Sure. And there was Basil Rathbone, and I've forgotten what this was all about. But I think it must have been someone who had either remembered Burma or... I don't know why, but I was going to be the mystery voice of the ages. I can't believe these things really went on, but they did. <laughs> so uh, they, again, for this, you see, this was very serious. This is big business. When you're going to be the voice of Fatima, that's not just coming in and doing a big acting job. You're the voice of Fatima. So lots and lots of people came to audition for that one. And Boy, I, why they, they decided that I was going to be the mystery woman of all time, I don't know, but they did. So I was the Fatima. And it was fun. I liked doing that. I didn't mind that it was commercial. I thought it was fine. I had a wonderful time doing it. Did you enjoy doing the um, the big shows? Um, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, Philip Morris Playhouse. and oh, uh, loved They were really stature. Just loved programs. it. And, of course, Charlie. Did you did you know Charlie Martin? Who no. used to oh, direct we heard the name. That. He was a director, I believe, right? 
Well, he really was a funny guy. I think he's out there in L.A. now. Uh, and I ran into him one day somewhere at a restaurant or something, and he immediately turned to whoever was his companion was and said, I discovered her, which I thought was fine. <laughs> I was very happy to have been discovered by Charlie. But he was... I loved him because he was highly theatrical. Now, here he was directing this radio program, but, of course, in those days, the radio program was done in a theater, mm -hmm. and all the actors dressed. You see, we wore long dresses, evening gowns, and looked glorious, and the director was all done up in evening clothes, and he directed in front as if he was Tuscanini, you see. And you would do wonderful material. You would do, oh, good, really good first-class movies and plays on this. Well, uh... Charlie gave me my first job on that in a play called uh, Of Mice and Men, and I had come up. It was also pretty soon after I got started, and I'd heard about this program, and I wanted to be on that because that had all these good plays, you see. So I called and went up to see him, and he he was very reluctant. He didn't, I didn't, nothing happened. There weren't any vibes, as the kids say, you know, across mm -hmm. the desk. And I said, well, can I audition for you, Mr. Martin? And he said, well, all right. Yeah, he'd have me audition. He said, well, do you think you can play this part? And I said, thought about it very well, very hard. And I said, yeah, I think so. So he stuck me in a control room by myself. And there I was, all by myself, you see, on the microphone, reading bits and pieces of, of Mice and Men. And every five minutes, he'd open the door and say, is that you? And I'd say, yes, that's me. He'd close the door, go away again, make me do it some more. He went on having me come in every day to audition for Of Mice and Men for eight days. I auditioned while he'd call other people because he didn't like me. He didn't like me, but he liked what it sounded like over there. <laughs> and it was just crazy. And finally he broke down and gave me the part, which was lovely because then I worked for him all the time. Oh, right? that was good. Yeah. yeah, it is funny that uh, when you're talking to a person like we are face to face, uh -huh. It's one thing, but if you listen in the control room and, and just hear the voice, it's, it's sometimes quite different. You know, you really you get a different, uh, completely different communication between the uh, the actor and actress and the person listening to them. I know, I know, because I used to do art. You know who Arthur Lawrence is? He's quite a well-known playwright, mm -hmm. and, and when he he started working writing for radio during those war years, and he uh, did some programs, and I I used to. On some of those documentaries about the war, I would have to play a little girl or, and an Italian prostitute. Are we allowed to say that on the radio? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, somebody's mother or sweetheart from Omaha. And you had to do all that stuff. You had to be able to go back and forth and say, Caramella, signore, can that <laughs> <laughs> I'll have one. <laughs> and you'd be playing these, of course, we have to make this very clear on the same show. Yes, on the same show, of course, within five minutes of each other. <laughs> sure, sure. Every once in a while, I was a listener in those days, of course. I, I had no idea what was going on other than the fact that I, I loved that, that business of what was happening on the radio. But every once in a while, I'd recognize a voice as being similar to a, a voice of another character. And only in later years did I realize that, of course, actors doubled and tripled and so on. Were, was that in any way in violation of the union contract? No, you were only... B before the union came into existence, people did do many, many different kinds of things. But then I think there were regulations on the documentary shows. I think you were allowed to do two or three or whatever it was. I don't I don't remember what the... No, they did. They doesn't be in violation. No. <laughs> and, of course, You the, get into uh, a lot of trouble. <laughs> it, it would work both ways because it would keep actors out of work. And I suppose the actor who was versatile would uh, would not be compensated that much more. Well, the thing, you didn't do that doubling and tripling except on a news kind of broadcast, news sort of mm. documentary kind, and, and you didn't have that much to do. You might have just a few lines. You know, you might, you might have to jump in quickly with a line or two, and they'd have to have hundreds of people if they really cast each one. Did anything untoward ever, ever happen, Francis, you know, where um, the script was changed at the last the minute? It always got changed at the last minute. You got cuts and changes on... Uh, you could get cuts and changes five or ten minutes before airtime. You had to learn how to mark your script so that you could read it, play truthfully, know what you were about. It's as if you memorized the action, the sequences, whether you did it consciously or not. You really knew what you were doing. And, of course, some of the half-hour shows and the hour shows, you would rehearse 
for several hours, for several days, so that you, and you took the script home, and then you would cut a record of the dress rehearsal, and the director would hear it, and sometimes the cat, oh, I've got a story about Charlie. I knew there was a reason why he's stayed in my heart all these years. I really have en en enormously appreciated the people from whom I've learned something in this business, and there have been many. But Charlie was one. He was, as I said, highly theatrical and pretty nutsy and a little weird, but by God, I learned <laughs> something from him. I had to play the second part in a mo our version of a movie called The Awful Truth. And I was playing, what in those days, a comedy girl, though kind of ancient, comic, sort of comic part. It wasn't the lead part, it was the second lead. And there was a comedy scene where this husband is outside the door. I don't remember the details of it. And I was behind the door, and I was supposed to be crying and not letting him in. Well, I was such a straight, legitimate actress that if I didn't really cry, well, how in the hell was I going to cry, you know? <laughs> so there I was, and I thought, we, I heard the record, and it sounded dreadful, just awful, I thought. And I said, Charlie, you're the director. Now, come on, you help me. It's terrible. He said, no, it's fine, it's fine. I said, it is not fine, it's awful. Now, you help me, it's your job. Now, you tell me how to fix that. He said, oh, for God's sake. He said, get up there. So I got up there. He said, all right, now you go, mm, who? I said, all right, mm, who? He said, all right, now you say that, mm, who, and keep saying it. So I went, mm, who, mm, who, mm, who, mm, who? He said, now say it faster. So I went, mm, who, mm, who, mm, who, mm, who? He said, that's it. <laughs> How about that? Oh, that's great. <laughs> so I will forever love Charlie Mark. That's no, a beautiful No tears story. when you do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about A House in the Country. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Well, A House in the Country uh, was very important in my life because... Um, well, I, 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 I don't really know how to get into this, and I don't even know that I want to get into it. I've been married twice in my life, and the first time was to David Lardner, who was the youngest of the Lardner boys. And I was fortunate enough, after his death, to marry Ring Lardner Jr., who was his brother. But at that time, at House in the Country time, I was just fresh married to David. And... Uh, House in the Country was an absolutely delicious, enchanting experience because it was a lovely program. In my opinion, it was quite a rung above the ordinary morning show because mm -hmm. it was comedic. It was based in kind of reality. It was about a young couple in New York who uh, escaped to the country to live happily ever after and do their work. The husband was a, uh, was a commercial artist, which right away was a little different from <laughs> the ordinary sort of thing that people did on, on soap operas in those days. And it had Thelma Ritter as the comedy interest in it. Now, you know, who could, who could ask for anything more? And we all liked each other enormously. Just, it, we were really a very happy, happy group. And, uh, you know, they were part of my life. Sure. Uh, I had a baby on House in the Country. <laughs> I'd gotten married on House in the Country. I, I think, sent my husband off to the wars in House in the Country. So it was a very touching and lovely and happy family experience for me. Hmm. You were playing yourself, really. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could be funny. That was the thing I liked. I liked the fact that I didn't have to weep and scream and cry. I could be funny. And yeah. Even if I cried, I was funny, and I yeah. liked that. Yeah. Especially having <laughs> Thelma around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lucille does it all the time, doesn't she? She cries yeah. and it's funny. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you, do you have a, a copy of A House in the Country? Yes, uh, a single copy, Nick. This is a hard one to come by, I but I did come up with one. It. Well, you just listen, Francis Cheney. You just listen. <laughs> This is the story of a house in the country, a house we all have dreamed of, a little house on a country road where the birds are singing in the trees. And maybe, maybe there's even sheep over in the next pasture. A house with a little white door, and when you knock, voices cordially say... Come in. Please, come in. In just a moment, then, we'll take you to visit a house in the country.
there, and welcome to A House in the Country. You're going to meet Joan and Bruce Marshall, two young city people who have left the skyscrapers of the city for a little white house on a country road. They're young, they're brimming with hope, and they're completely ignorant about country things. Today, as we join our friends, we find Bruce and Joan just settling down to read the evening paper. Come on, Joni, let's divide the Middle Falls Chronicle. Well, honey, you get the front half and I get the back half. If you want the front half... I still get the back half. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the back half. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, boy, this is good. It really is. <sighs> <sighs> Don't say it. You sit still, darling. I'll answer it. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Marshall? Yes. Uh, this is Mrs. Carlton. This is Ambrose Carlton. Uh, yes, Mrs. Carlton. Uh, Mrs. Marshall, I wonder if you're going to be home this evening. Why, well, yes, we are. Well, then I wonder if I might drop over and see you for a moment. I have something very important to talk to you about. Why, yes, Mrs. Carlton. We'd be delighted to have you. Thank you. I'll be over just as soon as my husband step the car out. Goodbye. Goodbye. So? That was Mrs. Ambrose Carlton. So? She wants to come up and see us tonight. What for? I don't know. That she had something important she wanted to talk to us about. Important? I bet she wants a donation for something. Well, whatever it is, we'll have to be nice to her. Mm. She's the one who always is on committees and things, isn't she? Mm. I've never met her, but she's a friend of Clarabelle Hopkins. I've seen her at church, and her name is always in the paper. Well, I... Hope she doesn't take up too much time and spoil our evening. So do I. Mm. Hey, speak of the devil. Hmm? Here's her name. In the paper? Yeah. Well? Mrs. Ambrose J. Carlton, chairman of the casting committee of Middle Falls Mask and Wig Society, announces that several selections have been made for the cast the annual play, Runaway Romance. But that there are still several parts open, including the feminine lead. Those interested apply. Oh, please. Yeah? That's what she's coming here for. What? She wants me to be in her play. Why should she? Oh, I told Clarabelle that I was president of the dramatic club in school and played leads in all the plays, and she probably told her. Good night. What do you mean, good night? I'd like to play the lead in this play. I haven't acted for ages. Okay, but I'll have nothing to do with it. If there's one thing I hate, it's amateur dramatics. Hey, where are you going? Change my clothes, of course. What's the matter with what you have on? Do you think Sarah Bernhardt would let a casting director see her looking like this? Old friends, hometown neighbors. Cromwell Savings Bank is now a division of Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank. And together, they serve your best interest in every banking way. Open an account in either bank, and you have an account at both. And beginning January 1st, 1976 you'll get full personal banking service, including checking accounts. Join the family in the main office in Middletown at the corner of Main and College Street at 846 Washington Street in Middletown, the Midway Shopping Center in Montville, Colchester Shopping Center, Colchester, 327 Main Street, Cromwell, or at the Cromwell Plaza near Kmart. In an age of expanding and changing bank services, Cromwell Savings Bank and Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank have joined together to serve your best banking interests in every way. Member FDIC. Our guest, Francis Cheney. And uh, we're uh, going to have to say good night, unfortunately, in uh, just a couple of minutes or so. But before we do, I'd like to uh, find out from you, Francis, if, uh, if I may, uh, did you make the transition from radio into television, uh, as many actors and actresses did? Well, in the early days of television... I was in California, and I had very young children, you know, really very young. And those early television shows were really something else. I mean, they were wild and woolly, weren't they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they sure were. <laughs> and I was a little uh, snooty about them. I don't, I don't know why I was snooty. I sure could have used the money, but I was a little <laughs> kind of, well, I didn't know with children and so on. I left California in 1950 or 51, I guess, and came back east finally via Mexico for six months before we moved back here. So there was a period when I was kind of out of the business for a while. 
and uh, I didn't really. Well, I came back and did a lead on Philco Playhouse in 1954. Fred Coe used me, and that was very nice, and I liked doing that. It was a very good, good script. And then uh, I don't know if you saw a program on television about John Henry Falk. I sure did. Yeah, well, I mean, if you I did, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, it was a very difficult and very sad time, and I have never spoken about it publicly. But it did happen, and it was no joke, and it was very, very difficult, and many of us fortunately survived. Uh, we did what we could. We worked in the theater. We worked wherever we could. But the Philco Playhouse program that I did in 1954 called Holiday Song was the last nighttime television show that I did until I did a Defenders in 1963. Yeah, I was able to do Edge of Night because that was a daytime show. I was put on it and I played it and it was fine. Uh, I did not start doing commercials until after I'd done that Defenders. And um, I really don't even like to think about it. At the same time, I think that I'm so glad that this program was aired last week because um, I think it's time that these things were no longer shoved under the rug. It's time that people like yourself, Francis Cheney, spoke out about those, those times to remind people what, uh, what we almost lost in the way of uh, our freedoms well, and Well, I'm glad you feel rights. that way. Uh, I, it was one reason that I mentioned the fact that I'd first been married to David Lardner and then married Ring Lardner Jr. because Ring was one of the Hollywood Ten, and that yeah. was a difficult thing for both of us. But we're strong and hale and hearty, and uh, we're fine. And I really feel, I, I personally feel quite reborn. <laughs> I'm delighted to know that. And Francis Cheney, thank you very much for being our guest tonight on the Golden Age of Radio. Until next time, this is Dick Bertel. And this is Ed Corcoran. Good night. <laughs>